Welcome to our channel. Today we're diving into the intriguing life of Leroy Nicky Barnes, a notorious figure in the world of organized crime, famously known as Mr. Untouchable. Leroy Barnes was born on October 15, 1933, in Harlem, New York, into a troubled family. His mother endured constant abuse from Barnes' father, an alcoholic and gambler who lacked a steady job. Observing his father's irresponsible spending while the family struggled, young Leroy turned to the streets. By the age of nine, he had already committed his first crime. Barnes's criminal journey began when he worked as a shoeshine boy. After noticing a drunk customer's wallet full of money, he impulsively stole it and was soon arrested. This incident marked his first step into a life of crime. At home, Barnes stumbled upon a bag of powdered substances, which he believed his father was hiding for financial gain. He sold some of the powder on the streets, initiating his involvement in the drug trade, a path that would eventually make him one of the most powerful drug lords in New York City. Harlem, in Leroy Barnes' memories, seemed like a paradise. But the reality was starkly different. The neighborhood was rife with youth gangs, and Leroy found himself joining one of them. These gangs frequently clashed, often using homemade firearms. Leroy managed to acquire a gun, but its first use came not against a rival gang, but in a moment of family turmoil. One day, as Leroy returned home, he witnessed a heated argument between his parents. The confrontation escalated, and his father, in a drunken rage, swung at Leroy's mother. Leroy, unable to stand by, shouted at his father to stop. In response, his father threatened him, pushing Leroy to fire the gun. Fortunately, the weak powder charge meant that no one was seriously harmed. Leroy's father only received a scratch on his jacket, and Leroy retained all his fingers. This incident prompted Leroy to leave home, seeking vengeance against his father. With the help of his gang friends, they tracked down where his father worked. Initially planning to kill him, the group settled on issuing threats instead. Shortly after, Leroy's father left the family. However, this departure did not deter Leroy from his chosen path of crime. Emboldened by the taste of cocaine, Leroy and a friend decided to rob a drug dealer. They scouted the dealer's house, noting the minimal security. The next day, armed and ready, they broke in and demanded money. In their haste, they forgot to close the door, attracting a crowd of neighbors. While Leroy's friend escaped through the hallway, Leroy had to jump out of a window, narrowly avoiding capture by three policemen below. Leroy's reputation on the streets grew, not from criminal exploits, but from his stylish appearance. Unlike his friends who spent money on drugs, Leroy invested in expensive clothing. His fashion sense caught the attention of a local drug dealer known as Fat Herbie. Impressed by Leroy's style and personal qualities, Herbie employed him as a courier. Over time, Leroy took on more significant responsibilities, including handling large sums of heroin. With steady income and access to drugs, Leroy's addiction deepened. To sustain his habit, he resorted to breaking into cars, searching for valuables to sell. During one such break, in Leroy was arrested and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. He served only a year and a half before being released on parole. Prison helped him kick his addiction, and upon release, Leroy vowed never to use drugs again, focusing solely on selling them. Leroy distanced himself from Fat Herbie forming his own gang. They amassed money through robberies, targeting houses and demanding valuables. Leroy's ruthlessness was evident when he forced an elderly woman to strip, seeing value even in worn clothes. The gang eventually secured enough funds to buy a car and establish a steady supply of high-quality heroin. Leroy's business expanded rapidly. He marked his heroin bags with black duct tape ensuring high quality that attracted addicts from all over Harlem. Leroy no longer sold drugs directly, but employed dealers and even a bodyguard, signaling his high status. Despite his success, 
Leroy's downfall began when his wife inadvertently exposed his operations to a police informant. This led to his arrest and a five-year prison sentence. In prison, Leroy encountered Matthew Madonna, a mafioso, who introduced him to the logistics of large-scale heroin distribution. Their partnership flourished and upon release, Leroy received substantial support from Madonna's network. This collaboration enabled Leroy to establish a sophisticated drug operation in Harlem, modeled after the Italian crime families. Leroy's organization, known as the Council, was a tightly knit group that dominated the heroin trade in New York City. Their operations were meticulously planned, ensuring high profits and minimal risk. Despite his eventual legal troubles, Leroy Barnes's criminal career left a significant mark on the history of organized crime in America. Leroy Nicky Barnes, seeking a more thrilling high, often mixed heroin with cocaine. However, the money he earned from his association with Fat Herbie soon fell short of funding his addiction. Desperate, Barnes resorted to breaking into parked cars, hoping to find valuables to sell for drug money. During one such break-in, he was arrested and sentenced to three and a half years in prison, though he served only a year and a half before being released on parole. His time in prison helped him overcome his addiction, and upon release, he vowed never to use drugs again, focusing solely on selling them. Deciding to part ways with Fat Herbie, Barnes formed his own gang with friends. To fund their first substantial drug purchase, they carried out home invasions, threatening residents and demanding valuables. In one incident, Barnes even forced an elderly woman to strip, recognizing the resale value of her expensive clothes. Gradually, the gang accumulated enough money to buy a car and secure a reliable supplier of high-quality heroin. Barnes preferred to sell heroin at night. Each morning, he would divide the heroin into portions, placing them in several bags and hiding these in secluded spots near meeting points for his dealers. To minimize risk, he kept the heroin at his home for as little time as possible. The business grew rapidly, thanks to Barnes's understanding of other addicts' needs. He marked his heroin bags with black duct tape, signaling high quality which attracted buyers from all over Harlem. Transitioning from direct sales, Barnes enlisted dealers to distribute the heroin and even hired a bodyguard, though the bodyguard mainly served as a status symbol. Despite his success, Barnes' downfall began when his wife inadvertently revealed his operations to a police informant. This led to his arrest and a five-year prison sentence. Leroy Nicky Barnes, despite his wealth and strong bodyguards, found himself vulnerable due to a betrayal from within his own home. His wife, Nita, unknowingly set the stage for his downfall. During a reunion with a childhood friend, Nita was asked whether her husband, Nicky Barnes, could provide some drugs. Nita, aware of her husband's activities, casually confirmed. Unfortunately, Nita's friend was a police informant. A few days after this conversation, the police raided Barnes' apartment. Although they did not find any drugs, the large amounts of cash and drug packaging tools were sufficient to charge him. Barnes was subsequently sentenced to five years in prison at the Green Haven Correctional Facility. While serving his sentence, Barnes met Matthew Madonna, a significant figure in the Lucchesi crime family. Madonna was deeply involved in heroin trafficking through a network known as the French Connection, which transported heroin from various parts of the world into the United States. Their relationship marked a turning point in Barnes' life. The French Connection originated in the French port city of Marseille, where the Ginny brothers, prominent criminals, established the network. After World War IE, the American intelligence services, including the CIA, sought the Ginny brothers' help to combat local communists who were disrupting the export of American goods to France. In return for their assistance, the CIA provided the Genie brothers with resources, which they later used to facilitate the heroin trade into the United States. Barnes and Madonna bonded over their shared experiences and ambitions. Madonna's expertise in large-scale heroin distribution provided Barnes with invaluable insights. 
This alliance would eventually enable Barnes to establish a sophisticated drug operation upon his release, significantly impacting the heroin trade in New York City. During the 1950s, the CIA was determined to maintain the flow of shipments to Europe, even if it meant collaborating with local gangsters. They allied with the Ginny brothers, notorious criminals who were given all the resources needed to combat striking workers, disrupting the port of Marseille. This partnership quickly restored order. The situation repeated itself during the Indochina War, with striking workers once again threatening supply lines. The CI turned to the Ginny brothers, paying $2 million and providing several crates of weapons to secure the port. With the port under their control, the Ginny brothers began importing opium from Indochina, processing it into heroin and exporting it to the United States. Meanwhile, Matthew Madonna, a significant figure in the Lucchesi crime family, found himself in prison on a murder charge, where he met Leroy Nicky Barnes. Despite their different backgrounds, Barnes and Madonna bonded over their shared interest in the heroin trade. Barnes admired the strong, family bonds among the Italians, contrasting with his own experience of isolation. Madonna saw potential in Barnes, hoping to expand his heroin distribution into Harlem through Leroy. Shortly before Barnes' release, Madonna offered him a deal, cooperation in the heroin trade. Barnes accepted, and upon his release, he received half a kilogram of heroin and $2,000 from Madonna's brother, Frank. This initial support allowed Barnes to buy a car, rent a stash house, and set up his own drug operation. Barnes's early days were not without conflict. He had a run-in with another dealer, Steve Austin, who tried to sell drugs on Barnes's turf. Unlike Barnes, Frank Madonna advised against violence, suggesting that quality would attract customers regardless of territory. Heeding this advice, Barnes moved his operations to a new neighborhood, focusing on maintaining high-quality heroin. Frank Madonna emphasized the importance of safety and discretion, advising Barnes to delegate tasks and avoid direct involvement with the drugs. Barnes implemented strict rules, including prohibiting any business, related discussions over the phone, a precaution that proved wise when the police began tapping the phones of his associates. Despite these measures, Barnes was arrested at a friend's apartment, leading to the discovery of half a million dollars worth of heroin. Charged with drug possession, Barnes was sentenced to 15 years in Greenhaven Prison. In prison, Barnes connected with local African Americans and converted to Islam, distancing himself from Madonna and his former lifestyle. Barnes also befriended Joe Gallo, an Italian prisoner who had distanced himself from other Italians. Their conversations often revolved around literature and philosophy, with Gallo introducing Barnes to influential works that shaped his thinking. Some speculate that Gallo played a role in Barnes's early release by helping him find procedural violations in his case. Upon his release, Barnes aimed to establish an organization modeled after Italian crime families, uniting disparate gangs under a single disciplined entity. Known as the Council, this group quickly dominated New York City's heroin trade, with each member overseeing a specific territory and network of dealers. The Council's meticulous planning and quality products ensured high profits and a lasting impact on the drug trade. Frank Madonna offered Leroy Barnes cooperation upon his release from prison, seeing potential in him. Frank provided Leroy with half a kilogram of heroin and $2,000, enabling him to buy a car and rent a secluded stash house. Frank continued to mentor Leroy, giving him valuable advice. A pivotal moment occurred when Leroy had a confrontation with another black drug dealer, Steve Austin, who attempted to sell drugs on Leroy's turf. Leroy was ready to resort to violence, but Frank intervened, advising him against it. Frank emphasized that customers cared more about the quality of the product than who controlled the territory. He saw Leroy as a long-term investment and advised him to relocate his operations rather than engage in a turf war. Frank reassured Leroy that if his product was good, buyers would always find him. 
Frank also focused on Leroy's safety, advising him to stay as far away from the drugs as possible and to delegate tasks to his employees. Leroy took this advice to heart, ensuring he remained in the shadows and coordinated operations without direct involvement. He also strictly prohibited any business related discussions over the phone, suspecting that the phones of his associates could be tapped by the police. Leroy Nicky Barnes was under constant surveillance, and on January 29, 1965, his associate Reggie's tapped phone led to Barnes's arrest at Reggie's apartment. Following the arrest, police searched a location where heroin was being packaged and seized half a million dollars worth of the drug. This arrest was the result of a prolonged investigation by the Bronx District Attorney's Office and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. After being released on bail, Barnes and his attorney attempted to contest the legality of the wiretap and the arrest itself, but their efforts were futile. Consequently, a jury found Barnes guilty of drug possession, sentencing him to 15 years in Green Haven Prison, a facility he had left only three years prior. While incarcerated, Barnes befriended local African Americans and converted to Islam, immersing himself in African history. At that time, a popular belief held that much of the world's cultural heritage, including Western culture, originated in Africa and was later appropriated by whites. Barnes became an ardent supporter of the Nation of Islam, a political and religious movement founded by African Americans in the 1930s. During his imprisonment, Barnes vowed never to use drugs again and abstained from consuming pork. He also distanced himself from his former associate, Matthew Madonna. While Madonna continued serving his time, he found Leroy's newfound hobbies amusing. Despite occasional tensions between Italians and African Americans in Green Haven Prison, these never escalated into open conflict. Both groups preferred to ignore each other. However, one Italian prisoner, Joe Gallo, broke this mold. Gallo, unable to connect with fellow Italians, formed a close bond with the black inmates and often defended them against the prison's dominating factions. Joe Gallo, a notable figure with a rebellious history in the Cosa Nostra, became friends with Barnes. There were rumors that Gallo might even consider becoming a heroin supplier for Barnes, but these remained unverified. Barnes fondly recalled their conversations, which often revolved around literature. Gallo was an avid reader, particularly of French existentialists like Sartre. It was through Gallo that Barnes discovered the works of Niccolo, that Barnes discovered the works of Niccolo Machiavelli, which he would later quote frequently. According to some accounts, Gallo played a crucial role in Barnes's early release from prison by guiding him to procedural errors in his case. However, Barnes's own version suggests that he stumbled upon this information independently while reading criminal law journals in the prison library. He came across the case of Katz v. United States, where the Supreme Court ruled that wiretaps without a warrant violated the Fourth Amendment, which protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Using this precedent, Barnes's lawyer successfully argued for his release and Barnes was freed after serving less than four years of his 15-year sentence. Once out of prison, Barnes sought to create an organized crime syndicate modeled after the Italian families. He envisioned a unified entity that would replace the fragmented gangs of Harlem. This new organization known as the Council comprised seven members, including Barnes, Joseph Hayden, Wallace Rice, Thomas Foreman, Ismail Muhammad, Frank James, and Guy Fisher. Many of these leaders were former addicts who had managed to rise from their struggles. The council bought heroin from the Italians and efficiently managed its distribution. Barnes's strategy included buying heroin on credit, processing it in rented apartments, and packaging it into thousands of portions. His operation was highly organized, and his understanding of the addict market helped him maintain high quality, attracting a wide clientele. Despite his eventual downfall, Leroy Nicky Barnes left a lasting impact on the drug trade in New York City. 
Barnes' attorneys challenged his indictment, arguing that the FBI's use of listening devices without a warrant violated the Fourth Amendment, which protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and requires court-issued warrants based on probable cause. Initially, the judge was not convinced, and Barnes was convicted. However, his defense team successfully appealed the conviction by citing the Supreme Court case Katz v. United States. In this case, the ruling established that wiretaps without a warrant in a phone booth infringed on Katz's right to privacy. Barnes' legal team used this precedent during his retrial, convincing the judge that the FBI's actions were unconstitutional. As a result, Barnes was released after serving less than four years of his 15-year sentence. Upon his release, Barnes aimed to establish a new, highly organized crime syndicate inspired by the Italian crime families. Rumors suggested that conversations with Joe Gallo, a fellow inmate, influenced Barnes' decision to create this new organization. Barnes envisioned a unified, disciplined entity replacing the fragmented gangs of Harlem. He established the Council, a leadership group consisting of seven members, including Joseph Hayden, Wallace Rice, Thomas Foreman, Ismail Muhammad, Frank James, and Guy Fisher. Notably, many of these leaders were former addicts who had overcome their struggles. The Council continued to source heroin from Italian suppliers, with Madonna's associates leaving cars filled with heroin in Manhattan parking lots. Barnes and his team would later exchange the heroin for cash, ensuring a steady supply for their operations. Barnes' understanding of the addict market and his commitment to high-quality products helped the Council dominate New York City's heroin trade. At the outset, Leroy Nicky Barnes procured heroin worth approximately $2, 5 cents million, initially securing the drugs on credit with a month to repay. The heroin was transported to one of his rented apartments, where hired women meticulously packaged it into 140 1,000 portions over two days. An additional 24 hours were spent thoroughly cleaning the apartment. Barnes spared no expense, paying each packer $115,000 for their labor. One portion of heroin, known as a New York Quarter, and roughly equivalent to a large tablespoon, sold for about $70, yielding a total revenue of approximately $10 million. Barnes's heroin was particularly popular among smaller street vendors due to its high quality. Dealers would break down a quarter portion into smaller doses and dilute it, yet even this diluted product sold quickly. The entire city was divided among council members. Guy Fisher controlled the South Bronx, Ismail Muhammad, Frank James and Wallace Rice oversaw the East Side, and Barnes, along with Joseph Hayden, managed Harlem. Each council member had an alternate who supervised around a dozen mid-level dealers, each of whom managed at least 40 street vendors. In total, thousands of people were involved in Barnes's operation. The council generated enormous profits. In the summer of 1973, Barnes set a record with a batch of 200 kilograms of heroin, netting the council $20 million. Barnes's business soon expanded beyond New York City, attracting dealers from Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Oakland. By 1976, his heroin was even being sold in Canada, making the council an international enterprise. Barnes lived a lavish lifestyle, frequenting the best nightclubs in the city and always dressing in expensive custom-made suits. His wardrobe boasted 300 suits, 50 leather coats, and around 100 pairs of shoes. He also had a penchant for luxury cars, owning a Bentley, a Citroën Sem, a Maserati, a Mercedes, Benz 300 and Says, Benz 300 and Cell, several Cadillacs, and a yellow Volvo. To avoid attracting the attention of tax authorities, Barnes created a network of fictitious companies that ostensibly leased him the cars on a long-term basis. Barnes also engaged in charitable activities. Starting in 1974, he participated in the Harlem Weeks, an initiative aimed at celebrating and supporting the local community. Annual community events were organized to introduce New Yorkers to the culture of black neighborhoods, 
with Barnes playing an active role. He supported orphans and single mothers, distributed turkeys on Thanksgiving, and gave free gifts to children on Christmas Eve. However, this apparent generosity was underpinned by the harsh reality that Harlem had been transformed into a ghetto, largely due to the influx of heroin. From 1970 to 1974, the number of heroin addicts in the United States doubled, with Harlem being a stark representation of this crisis. Barnes later justified his actions by saying that if he hadn't filled the streets with drugs, someone else, whether Italian or Latino, would have, and none of them would have, and none of them would have given anything back to Harlem. During this period, the issue of drug addiction gained national attention. In 1971, President Richard Nixon declared drug addiction as public enemy number one and called for an all-out offensive to combat it. Meanwhile, New York State, under Governor Nelson Rockefeller, introduced some of the toughest anti-drug laws in the country. Sale of two ounces of heroin, cocaine, morphine, opium, or marijuana was punishable by 15 to 25 years in prison and possession of four ounces or more carried the same penalty. Despite these stringent measures, the number of drug addicts continued to rise. Barnes found these governmental efforts laughable, believing that the root of the problem lay within the police force itself. He claimed that many of the detectives in the Special Investigations Division were involved in drug trafficking. His assertions were not far from the truth. In 1972, a major scandal erupted when it was discovered that drugs seized during the French Connection investigation in 1962 had gone missing from a police warehouse. This incident underscored the corruption and inefficiency that plagued the efforts to curb drug trafficking in New York City. The bag initially thought to contain drugs was found to have flour and starch instead. The theft of the drugs remains unsolved, with the only suspect, New York City Police Detective Joseph Enns, later found dead in his car. Officially deemed a suicide, rumors quickly spread that Enzi had been murdered. In response to public outcry, the state governor tightened existing laws, mandating life imprisonment without parole for any dealer caught red-handed. This harsh measure was criticized by many, including New York Mayor John Lindsay, who called it vindictive, Residents, especially those in Harlem, saw it as a conspiracy against vulnerable individuals. To quell public unrest, authorities needed to capture a high-profile drug trafficker, proving the law targeted major criminals, not just small-time dealers. They enlisted the help of the press. Shortly after the Rockefeller Act was passed on January 8, 1973, the New Yorker published an article titled Untouchables, 11 top names in the city's drug trade, featuring Leroy Nicky Barnes. Barnes later remarked that while most people paid to have their photos in the paper, he was published for free. Other journalists followed suit, sensationalizing Barnes's activities. Headlines claimed Barnes led a black mafia and some falsely linked him to the Symbionese Liberation Army, a notorious left-wing terrorist group. Despite these fabrications, Barnes believed his photogenic appearance fueled the media's interest. He noted that newspapers aimed to boost sales by featuring captivating photos, and his image in a luxurious suit was more appealing than that of less photogenic dealers like Josie Rosa, a major figure in Harlem's Hispanic drug scene. The Rockefeller Act took effect on September 1, 1973. To mark the occasion, the New York Police Department planned a surprise for Barnes. On August 29, as Barnes returned to New York from a meeting with his lawyer in Detroit, he was met with unexpected developments. Barnes had planned to meet his wife, but she wasn't home. Alarmed, he called her and found out that the electricity was out in the area and the elevator in their building wasn't working. His wife, holding their one-year-old child, was unwilling to navigate the dark stairs, Barnes reassured her, saying, Stay calm, honey. I'll take a cab and see you soon. Upon arriving home, Barnes comforted his wife before heading out on business. When he returned the next day, he was met by 15 police officers at the entrance to his 13th floor apartment. 
The officers handcuffed him and proceeded to search his apartment. Instead of finding a large drug lab, they discovered Barnes' frightened wife nursing their daughter. The police searched the apartment but found only $50,000 in cash and a few firearms. Barnes grew anxious when an officer emerged from his bedroom carrying a leather travel bag, expecting the bag to contain pre-prepared drugs. Barnes was surprised to see only documents and dirty clothes inside. The officer's haul was minimal, with the sniffer dogs locating only the butt of a marijuana joint in the bathroom. While Barnes was in Detroit, the police had suspected he might have fled to the Caribbean to evade Rockefeller's law. They had been tapping his home phone and interpreted his reassuring phrase to his wife, stay calm, honey, as a possible code. Their suspicions escalated when surveillance reported Barnes exiting a cab with a large leather bag. After questioning the cab driver, who mentioned picking Barnes up near the airport, the police were convinced they were onto something. During that era, airport security was lax, and couriers often transported drugs in hand luggage. The police imagined the bag filled with heroin from France or Vietnam and were confident in their assumptions when they saw Barnes heading home. Due to the power outage, Barnes had to navigate the dark stairs, further heightening the police's suspicions. Running up 13 flights of stairs proved to be an impossible task for the police officers, given the non-working elevator and lack of electricity in the building. They concluded that Nicky Barnes had taken the stairs, fearing an ambush at the elevator doors. These observations led the judge to grant the police a search warrant. In his book, Barnes openly mocks the police, viewing the search as a desperate attempt to justify eight months of fruitless investigation. He believed the officers had spent too much time and money and needed to prove their worth to their superiors. Barnes recounted that he was constantly under surveillance, with agents tracking his movements, tapping his phone and parking outside his home 24-7. Despite this extensive effort, Barnes claimed it was all in vain. Barnes suspected the search was more a signal to him that times had changed and he could no longer operate as freely. At the time, he was more concerned with money laundering than law enforcement or the Rockefeller drug laws. As he pointed out, driving a Maserati and owning several penthouses while reporting an income of only $330,000 a year was bound to attract his attention. Determined not to meet Al Capone's fate, Barnes, with his lawyer's help, found a way to use the tax system to his advantage. Barnes decided to invest his drug money in FEI, Federal Housing Administration, projects. The FA, founded by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, aimed to ensure mortgage loans and provide access to affordable mortgages for low- and middle-income people. This investment allowed Barnes to launder his money effectively, making the system work for him rather than against him. For example, in the development of residential apartment complexes, Barnes could launder millions through his organization. Additionally, he benefited from a partial tax abatement during construction. Barnes often fantasized about where to invest his laundered money. In his memoir, he mentioned dreams of building a massive shopping mall in Harlem and creating a nationwide network of automated car washes. Such investments would have transformed him from a notorious drug dealer into a legitimate businessman. Another challenge Barnes faced was managing large amounts of cash. He found a solution through a local church he attended with his wife. The church's director would store the money in the church's endowment fund for a fee of tunes. This arrangement ensured that when bail was needed, there were no questions about the money's origin due to the church's reputable standing. However, this strategy didn't always work. On May 11, 1974, Barnes was arrested on suspicion of murder, and the judge set bail at $100,000. The church director offered the full amount the next day, but the Bronx district attorney, Mario Merola, rejected it. Merola convinced the judge to hold a hearing to determine how the impoverished parish could afford such a large sum. The director's explanation failed to satisfy the prosecution, especially since the church had only $330 in its account at the time of Barnes' arrest. Consequently, bail was denied. 
Efforts to secure Barnes' release continued for nearly two months until his attorney provided the necessary funds, claiming they were part of Barnes' real estate investments. Although Mr. Untouchable was eventually freed, the media extensively covered the incident, nearly destroying his empire. Journalists didn't just write about Barnes. They turned him into a public figure, making him too recognizable for face, to face meetings with his associates. This increased visibility significantly complicated his operations. Barnes introduced Guy Fisher to Matthew Madonna, but their relationship was problematic from the start. According to Madonna, Fisher failed to show the proper respect. Additionally, Fisher faced another issue when two of his minor dealers were arrested and had to surrender their profits and remaining drugs. Fisher, feeling insulted, killed both dealers. This action outraged the council as murder was considered a last resort and had to be a unanimous decision. Fisher ignored these protocols and acted independently, justifying his actions by claiming authority over his subordinates. Fisher's troubles escalated. On September 30, 1974, he was on his way to meet Madonna to collect keys to a car loaded with heroin, carrying $100,000 in cash. After committing a traffic violation, Fisher was stopped by police. He provided a fake driver's license, prompting the officers to search his vehicle. Upon finding the cash, Fisher attempted to bribe them, leading to his immediate arrest and bribery charges. The money was confiscated, and Barnes had to bail Fisher out and settle with Madonna. When Fisher repaid Barnes, he was $5,000 short, which planted seeds of doubt in Barnes' mind. Fisher aspired to become a legitimate businessman, but had different ambitions than Barnes. While Barnes sought practical ventures, Fisher was captivated by the idea of purchasing the Apollo Theater. This iconic concert hall had played a significant role in African-American music history, but had fallen on hard times in the 1970s. Fisher believed that acquiring the theater could revive its former glory the council sought to legitimize their operations and considered purchasing the Apollo Theater, which was up for auction at a bargain price of half a million dollars. The theater's status as a historic landmark also promised significant tax benefits. However, in 1976, as they were preparing for this purchase, they faced a major setback. Their primary supplier, Matthew Madonna, was no longer available. This urgent need for a new supplier led them to a Mexican dealer named Bonito Cortina. Barnes invested $250,000 in Cortina's first shipment, but he was disappointed with the quality. Unlike Madonna's pristine white heroin from Marseille, the Mexican product was dark brown and of inferior quality. Despite this, Barnes had no other options and reluctantly bought the drugs. His associates then worked diligently to refine the brown heroin into a more marketable white powder. Meanwhile, Guy Fisher, a key member of the council, was on trial and sentenced to a year in prison for attempting to bribe police officers. Barnes' own trial commenced shortly after, three years after the initial raid on his apartment. Prosecution used sniffer dogs to argue that drugs had been stored in Barnes's car and apartment. The dogs had reacted to heroin in the courtroom, but Barnes's attorney cleverly demonstrated that they also reacted to a box of aspirin, casting doubt on the reliability of this evidence. Despite winning this round, Barnes's luck was running out. The inferior Mexican heroin did not sell as well as Madonna's high-quality product. Desperate for new suppliers, the council members scoured the streets, but were not always cautious. Joseph Hayden claimed to have found a solution through a man named Louis D., who boasted he could procure anything from a tank to a ton of heroin at unbeatable prices. However, Louis was experiencing financial troubles, complicating the situation further. Joseph Hayden had always been known as a somewhat reckless individual, but his latest actions had crossed a line. He had secretly arranged a major heroin purchase without consulting Leroy Nicky Barnes, paying for two kilograms of heroin up front. Furious at this betrayal, 
Barnes decided to confront Hayden. On the night of March 15, 16, 1976, Barnes drove to the meeting, unaware that it was a trap. Both he and several other members of the council, including Guy Fisher and Hayden himself, were arrested. The police seized over $30 million in cash during the operation. The judge set Barnes' bail at $300,000. After securing his release, Barnes quickly began reviewing the case files. He discovered that Louis Diaz, a DEA special agent, had been working undercover for years. Diaz had posed as a mafia associate, moving from family to family and occasionally dealing drugs. This cover allowed him to infiltrate the council through one of Hayden's associates. Eager to prove their worth, Barnes' men had unknowingly divulged critical secrets to Diaz. Amid these legal troubles, Barnes's lawyer received a call from Fred Fetty, the editor-in-chief of the New York Times magazine. Fetty informed him that an article about Mr. Untouchable was set to be published, and he wanted Barnes to pose for the cover photo. Given the upcoming trial, the lawyer initially declined, not wanting to draw unnecessary attention. However, the magazine's executive editor soon called back, stating that they had a police photo of Barnes from the night of his arrest. If Barnes refused to pose, they would use the police photo instead. Realizing the potential impact on the jury pool, Barnes agreed to the photo shoot. He wanted to present himself in a way that would resonate with a middle-class Manhattan juror on June 5, 1977. The New York Times magazine published the issue with Barnays on the cover. He wore a simple, light-colored denim suit and a red, white, and blue tie, standing modestly but confidently in front of the camera. The caption under the photo read simply, Mr. Untouchable. Nicky Barnes, once considered Harlem's most prominent drug dealer, drew the ire of law enforcement and even the President of the United States. President Jimmy Carter, known for starting his day with the latest press, was struck by Barnes' audacious presence in a magazine cover story. Reportedly, Carter remarked, if we can't arrest this man, then something is wrong with our justice system. This spurred the U.S. Attorney General to take every possible measure to bring Mr. Untouchable to justice. The efforts culminated in Barnes receiving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. To ensure a fair trial and protect the jury from potential threats, the court implemented the first anonymous jury in U.S. history, comprising 15 individuals whose identities were kept secret. Initially, Barnes received positive updates from his associates, collectively known as the Council. However, over time, troubling news began to filter through. One such piece of news concerned Guy Fisher, a key member of the council, who had abandoned plans to purchase the Apollo Theater due to the deteriorating state of their operations. Barnes's personal life also took a hit. During a visit, his wife informed him that she had seen Guy Fisher at a basketball game with Barnes's mistress, Shimika. Although Barnes had previously noticed Shimika's overly friendly behavior toward Guy, he hadn't given it much thought. The council had strict rules prohibiting relationships between members and each other's partners with violations punishable by death. Lacking concrete evidence, Barnes couldn't directly accuse Fisher. He decided to confront Shimika, who denied any wrongdoing. This temporarily eased Barnes' concerns. However, six months later, he encountered a gang member known as G. Jane Prison, Jage hinted at further complications, suggesting that Barnes's suspicions might not have been entirely unfounded. Guy never visited him once. JJ also shared a story about their comrade Bob, who was out on parole. The council was supposed to pay Bob $500 for every week he spent in prison. However, when Bob demanded the money owed to him, Fisher refused. Bob's troubles didn't end there. While he was in prison, his girlfriend became Fisher's mistress. Through a small bribe, Barnes managed to use the phone in the break room. After contacting several subordinates, Nikki learned the true state of affairs. Many of the heroin suppliers had refused to cooperate with the council because Guy Fisher didn't pay them on time. The product from the remaining suppliers was of poorer quality, making it difficult for small dealers to sell. 
This news shocked Barnes, who had invested significant effort into establishing a sterling reputation for his product. His successors had ruined it. The council had even stopped paying Nicky's lawyers. Barnes' doubts were confirmed a month later when he received a large envelope containing photos of Schmika and Guy together, and Guy together at dinner and a basketball game, with one picture showing Guy kissing Schmika. The envelope had no sender's name, but inside was a short note from the Drug Enforcement Administration. Barnes initially resisted cooperating with authorities, having received offers to turn in his associates before, which he always firmly refused. However, realizing he would not receive help from counsel, he changed his mind. Driven by a desire for revenge, Barnes decided to expose his former comrades. As one journalist noted, Mr. Untouchable had become Mr. Tell. All to ensure Guy Fisher and others ended up behind bars, Barnes was willing to reveal all the murders committed by the council. On January 4, 1983, Barnes appeared before a grand jury and detailed all the crimes he had committed with the council since 1973. He pleaded guilty to drug trafficking and participating in participating in decision-making processes for four murders. On March 10 of that year, Guy Fisher was arrested. In August 1998, Nicky Barnes, then 64 years old, was released from prison, thanks in large part to U.S. Attorney General Rudolph Giuliani, who succeeded in getting Barnes's life sentence overturned. Since then, Barnes had been in the Witness Protection Program, rumored to be living somewhere in the Midwest. On June 18, 2012, Nicky Barnes passed away from cancer. His death remained undisclosed until the summer of 2019. The story of Nicky Barnes is far from instructive. Life seldom gave him a chance to choose a different, non-drug-related path. Mr. Untouchable evokes neither horror nor pity. He was as unique as the Harlem of the 1970s, a place now consigned to history. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this dive into the life of Leroy Nicky Barnes, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like this video, push the bell icon to get notified of new uploads, and share it with your friends. See you next time.